Welcome to EWTN's continuing live coverage of the Synod of Bishops on the Family. We are in the very last days of this Synod meeting. This morning, the commission appointed by Pope Francis to draft the Synod's final document finished the first draft and presented it to the Synod Fathers for their consultation. Tomorrow, they will suggest changes they would like to see reflected in the document. Then on Saturday, they will vote on the final document paragraph by paragraph. And then once any changes are made, the final document will be given to Pope Francis. We don't know what, if anything, will be made public, but we'll keep you up to date on that as we get more information. As we know, the, the Commission of Ten is in charge of writing the Relatio Finalis, the final document, and they've all been personally appointed by Pope Francis himself. Three are from the Synod's Secretariat, Cardinals Baldessardi, Erdo, and then Archbishop Forte. And then we have the Superior General of the Jesuits, representing all men and, men and women religious around the world. The other six members were chosen to represent the five continents, breaking North and South America into two regions. So there are two representatives there for the Americas. At today's press conference, the main topic was the drafting of this very document. One of the members of the Commission of Ten, Cardinal Oswald Gracias, was present to respond to the many questions. He explained the process of the drafting, beginning with the number of changes that have already been suggested. The length, uh, I was out of curiosity looking, I, I suppose that I can reveal, if both my brother bishops allow me. It's, it's, I, I, thought, I thought it was 147, but now I realize it's, it's a hun, an under 100, we've made it to under 100. Uh, Cardinal Baldissieri, the Secretary General, will speak a bit of the procedure that we followed uh, when preparing this uh, final relatio report or reflections. And then uh, Cardinal Erdo, who's the relator, uh, we plan that, uh, it's planned that he will give a brief presentation of this, very brief, but not read it. And then the text will be given to the Synod Fathers. Uh, the idea is that they have the whole evening and then uh, tomorrow, mo tomorrow morning we meet in general congregation and the general congregation will then uh, discuss this and give uh, give their comments. They're supposed to give uh, any written amendments again, uh, we hope by lunch or two o'clock, three o'clock, and the commission will meet again uh, tomorrow evening. We'll again, the experts will put it together, put it in order. We'll meet tomorrow evening and uh, we try to uh, polish the final draft which will be presented on Saturday. I was trying to calculate. Uh, there possibly would be close to seven, 800 uh, Modi must have come all together, not to show the exact figure, because they, we broke them up into three groups. Now, what we did was uh, the, 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 all the amendments were given to the, the experts, and the, the experts and the secretaries of the groups, those who drafted the, uh, of our workshops, uh, they sat together and uh, Put them, uh, they sorted them out, and they, they gave a value, like a value for them. They said, okay, this seems good to study. This this seems you could, uh, it's repetitious, doesn't add anything more. And all that was sent to us. Uh, then we went through each of them and uh, tried to take whatever was good in every mode. We had, it took a long, long time. That's Today, the church celebrates the feast of Pope St. John Paul II, and his document, Familiaris Consortio, came up as the basis for the synod. Let's listen. I think John, Pope John Paul, St. John Paul, uh, already with a vision, had uh, given a certain opening, which uh, in a certain number 84, which is quoted very often, said how you cannot look at every case in the same way in many pastoral situations. And uh, now he's given an indication on the other hand, come uh, sono nuove sfide, dobbiamo anche affrontare, and I would think that that's that, that's precisely the the whole idea of the synod. How do we today uh, face these challenges of today? Doctrine remaining the same, uh, principle of faith remaining the same. We've got to certainly indissolubility is a great gift which God has given us. That. I'd like to welcome my first guest, Dr. Joseph Meany, Director of International Outreach and Expansion for Human Life International and a longtime Rome resident himself until recently. Thank you for being on the program, Dr. Meany. Thank you very much. It's windy night here in the Eternal City, yes. <laughs> where we're a little cold. Um, but you've lived in Rome for many years. You're a scholar. What have been your general impressions of this synod so far? 
It's been a remarkable synod. I mean, there have been fireworks from the very beginning. Uh, the Holy Father asked for an open and frank discussion, and he definitely got it. Definitely. Um, and we've been trying to follow that day by day. And as someone pointed out, we're not just covering the synod. We're covering the press conferences that actually tell us what's right. going on in the synod. And so many, thank goodness, that the synod fathers have been so generous with their time to, to help us and the folks at home uh, stay up to date on all of these things. One topic that came up, and I know you wrote your doctoral dissertation on this, it touched on this, is the theme of conscience. Um, this term has been picked up in their discussions, but do you think it's been dealt with a, enough in, during the Synod? You know, one of the problems is the Synod Fathers have only had three minutes to speak about these topics, and conscience is very complicated. You can't just talk about conscience. The Church has always said you have to form your conscience, and you can't just have a deeply held belief. You really have to go to Church authorities. You have to look at, at the issue from a very deep, objective perspective. And unfortunately, people take conscience for all kinds of different things that it's not. For ex I think that's a good point you're making, because in the modern world, it's kind of like, well, if I believe it to be true, therefore I'm following my conscience. What do you mean by how can we form our consciences better? Right. I mean, what the most important thing to remember about conscience is it's determining what is right and what is wrong. So it, it creates us as a human being. We have to decide what is right and what is wrong, and so we have to really study it. It's not something that just comes naturally. I mean, there, there's an inner voice of conscience, mm. but it has to be fed. And one can even be deluded in conscience. So it's important to have a, a really good grasp of it. So when we, when we think, you know, well, I in good conscience, maybe I'm not in a state of grace, but I feel in good conscience that I could go to communion. So maybe this is where some problems come from? Absolutely. No, and you know, there was a big problem after Humanae Vitae came out. I mean, people were saying, follow your conscience, do whatever you want, but they weren't telling them to form their conscience mm. and to form it with the church. I mean, with the church's teaching, that's the basis of our conscience. It's hard to say to this world today, isn't it? Like, yes. uh, just because you think it is, doesn't mean it's absolutely true. And to ask them to have recourse to the church is probably not what they want to hear either. So it's, it's kind of hard to talk about the word conscience and actually get across. So I I think that's been a um, challenge that they've been facing. Freedom of conscience is important. This has to do with religious liberty. We are seeing this play out in the U.S. and around the world. But if you think of it again as whatever I think is right happens to be right, um, then we run into problems, right? especially like in this religious freedom right now. And there's a, there's a massive attack against conscience. So doctors who do not want to perform abortions, mm. people who do not want to have contraception in their health care plans, they're not being allowed that right of conscience. And it was amazing, I thought, when the Holy Father was coming back from the U.S that he really spoke to that issue. He did. He, uh, he was talking about, I think he wasn't just addressing particular situations, but I guess it would, it would apply to politicians, people who in their line of work have to personally object to something because it conflicts with their faith. And I think Christian families, don't you, are facing that now more than ever. We don't want the state telling us how to raise our kids, for example, or when they should learn about certain facts of life, shall we say. I mean, Absolutely. How do we... I mean, the one-liner from the Holy Father was that conscience is a human right and has to be put into all the juridical structures. And the follow-up question was, what about government health care workers? And he said, if they're human beings, they should have human rights. And I think right. that's, that's a very good way to put it. I think this is happening worldwide too, right? You travel the world. Now with Human Life International, you have a huge scope. You're able to see Christian families and all of their various cultural situations. Um, what are the maybe the common problems that you think they're all facing as you travel the globe? Yeah, well it's interesting to see. Around the world, the family's in trouble. There are a lot of attacks against the family. Yeah. There's a lot of divorce. There's a lot of attacks against life. I mean, abortion mm. is a global scourge. So when I travel around the world, I see that. What can we do? I mean, what, are, what do you think these bishops are thinking? You know, because it's a problem that they're facing in every, doesn't matter where you're, different areas of the globe are experiencing different problems and they're voicing them in the Synod Hall. Yes. Um, but problems that we may not have in the West, problems we have they don't have in the East, but this problem of abortion and, and say maybe divorce might be worldwide yeah. enough. Um, do you think this, are they gonna go home and make new pastoral practices? What can we expect, do you think, after this is over? Well, something that has been you know, talked about is this decentralization and what goes on. And, and I've seen around the world that, you know, the church is very different, but it always keeps the same faith and the same morals. And so, you know, in Rwanda, for instance, they clap at the consecration because when the king of king arrives, you have to clap because that's what they did for their natural kings. And that's wonderful. That's enculturation. Yeah. But when you look at, uh, you know, what's, what's the content of the faith, mm. you know, what, what is our moral belief? That cannot change anywhere. So we can't say, all right, you know, 
the church doctrine can be different, say in yeah. Germany or Africa, than it right. can be in Alaska. Right. That, that can't change, that has to come to Rome. Yeah. So because there has been this focus on, let's say, certain decisions are gonna be made at the, at the diocesan level, and that's one thing that's coming out of this synod, but what kind of decisions? Exactly right, I yeah. mean, pastoral practices can be very different in different parts of the world, as long as they don't change mm. what the church believes right. and what the church teaches. Now you work with an organization that educates priests and seminarians, and I think laity as well, on how to defend life. Yes. How, do, how do we take this message to the streets? And I, I imagine you can help Episcopal organizations, you know, organizations of uh, bishops' conferences do this. What is your advice to them on how to end the scourge of abortion, euthanasia, all of these attacks against human life? I think it's very, very important to encourage good families. Mm. Encourage families that are trying to live the faith, individuals are trying to live the faith, because a lot of them feel discouraged, and as Cardinal Dolan said, kind of a minority within the world, but also within the church. They need encouragement from their pastors. Yeah, because there's a lot of families doing the right things. What did you think about that idea that they came up with? It sounds like a great idea and it came up, it seems like time and time again, of families being missionaries to other families. Yes. You know, the, two, the newlyweds are going to be helped out by the couple celebrating their 40th wedding anniversary. Yes. I think in marriage preparation, and that has to be a real theme here at the Synod okay. afterwards, that better marriage preparation. But couples with a lot of years of experience in married life can really, really help these young people that are preparing for marriage. I think that's very key. I think that's one thing that, yeah, definitely come out. Better marriage prep so we don't have these problems at the end when we're, yes. we're talking about annulments now and all of that so yes. a great dr joseph meany thank you so much for joining us of mm. human life international on the program and bringing so much clarity to this discussion thank you so much we have to take a break but stay tuned for more live synod coverage from rome Welcome back to EWTN's coverage of the Synod on the Family, live from Rome. I have the pleasure of welcoming as my next guest, Archbishop Jose Gomez of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Your Excellency, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Thank you. Um, we know you, the Synod Fathers let out a little early this evening, so that was good news for us around 6, <laughs> which has not have been normal at all, has it? No, that's the first time. Yeah, yeah. it's been really good. But I heard there was a, an important announcement, which was not new to you synod fathers who have known about it, but to the rest of the world, the Holy Father made an announcement today about the formation of a new dicastery. That's correct. I, I think it is a, a new dicastery that's going to be uh, uh, about the family okay. and uh, the lay faithful. Uh, so it's basically putting together several of the different pontifical commissions that we had mm -hmm. in the past. Um, so uh, like, like the... Uh, a pontifical commission for the family, for the laity, so they are going to be together in a different structure that is more, more representative of, of the um, priority that the Holy Father wants to give to the lay people in the church. Oh, that's that's one fruit of the Synod we're seeing we're seeing already. Uh, we we know that the relatio finalis was presented today. Um, a day that y'all haven't really had a chance to consult it yet, but this is the final document that will be handed to Pope Francis for his consultation, and then he will decide whether to maybe make a, an exhortation like familiaris consortio or so. But it's been a lot of work, hasn't it? <laughs> he has. Yeah, as you know, the the purpose of the Synod is to advise the Holy Father on some specific issues, and in this case, about marriage and the family. So that's what we have been working on for the last three weeks. Uh, so I think it's wonderful that we have a final document. Uh, we need to go through it. I think tomorrow we're gonna talk about it mm -hmm. at the, uh, at the uh, uh, general congregation of the Synod, and then on Saturday we vote on uh, each one of the paragraphs, <laughs> so it's going to be a long session. There's probably a lot of paragraphs, but that will be a long <laughs> session. So that's why we were a little surprised that you guys got out early, so I'm glad for that. Um, one issue that is close to your heart is, is immigration, and that's an issue affecting families all over the world. Families um, afflicted by poverty and war, they're being torn apart, and immigration is a result of that. Do you think this issue was addressed, because we haven't really talked about it even here on our show, the issue of immigration, yeah. has it been dealt with in the Synod Hall? Well, I mean, I, I'm being a little disappointed because uh, there are many other issues that are important for the family, 
uh, for marriage and the family, like uh, preparation for marriage or, uh, you know, how to support families in the first years of once they get married. Then also the, uh, the uh, uh, challenges that we have in society with poverty with, uh, and with immigration. Uh, fortunately, because the, uh, the, the uh, instrumental labor is, was not really uh, uh, appropriate for what our discussions were all about, so we spent a lot of time working on the uh, okay. instrumental labor is, and we have been able to really have a good conversation on those other topics. Specifically about the immigration, obviously it's a big challenge mm -hmm. uh, for society. Uh, the reality is that people move. No matter what, we, what we see right now in, uh, in the Middle East, people coming to Europe, is a horrible tragedy. People just leaving everything and just walking uh, and going through the uh, Mediterranean Sea to look for a better life. And that's the reality of life. In the United States, the challenge that we have is uh, the reality of uh, 11 million people that are undocumented in the United States uh, uh, and that we need to find a solution for them. And the, the fact that in the last few years, I think five, uh, two million people were deported and one of every four was part of a stable family. So immigration is really uh, affecting family life all over the world. So I think it is important for us to talk about it and find a solution. And um, I know it's important to the Holy Father as well. He's gone and one of his first trip, I think, was down yes. to Lampedusa here in Italy, which is where the immigrants come in and many of them perish along the way and, and you mentioned the Middle East where many of them are leaving because their very lives are threatened and the families are being torn apart and, and so there'll be some good pastoral solutions maybe coming home with the bishops in their various parts of the world. I hope so. I hope that in the final document there are several uh, uh, paragraphs <laughs> talking about you know practical things that we yeah. can do to take care of people. I think the most important thing is to reach out to them and help them in the reality mm -hmm. of the challenges that ha they have in the daily life. They are husband and wife, they are brothers and sisters, they have children. So I think it's important for us as Catholics, as Pope Francis is uh, uh, telling us, to reach out to these people and yeah. help them in their needs. And welcome, and we know that they welcome two families even in the Vatican walls. They, they said two of the immigrant families could live in there. I wanted to bring up the issue of um, conscience. Our Archbishop Supich of Chicago stressed the primacy of the individual conscience and in making decisions about whether to receive communion if you're divorced or remarried. And he said the Pope and the Synod could grant bishops and pastors a little leeway to treat each couple on a case by case basis. What about this conscience in a case by case basis if we're talking about divorced and remarried? Uh, well, obviously every case is different. So, mm. uh, but I think we need we all need to understand that conscience. Is a, is a judgment that uh, is based on, uh, on scripture and, uh, and tradition. Uh, it's not just a feeling. It's a real understanding of uh, what is God plan for humanity and what is it that God wants from me. So uh, it's got to be a, a, a well-formed conscience that helps us to make the decisions in our lives. Uh, so I, I, I think that's the important thing. We need to find a way to uh, help people to have a well-formed conscience. And then obviously uh, that's when, when every case is, is, is going to must be, and, and in any situation in life, we, uh, we don't judge people in general. We, as Jesus did, we talk to each one and try to help those, those specific persons to uh, live and act according to God's will uh, for them and for, for, for humanity and for the church. That's a challenge, um, mercy and, and truth reaching out in the mercy. How do you do that as pastors? You, you want to bring the fullness of the truth and bring them the fullness of God's unfathomable mercy. You know, I, what I've been talking about is, is the beautiful plan of God mm. for, for the human person, for creation. I think Pope Francis in, in Laudato Si helps us to understand mm. a little bit that beautiful plan of God for humanity. Mm. And I think the more that we know about that, what is it that God wants for us? for the world, for uh, creation, for the human person, for the family, for, for the church. Uh, that's the way that we form our conscience. When we discover that beautiful plan of God, then we understand that that, that, that plan includes some challenges and mostly joy, because mm -hmm. we are doing what God planned for humanity. It's hard to convey that maybe to this world of today, that seeking joy in, in so many other things, 
and to say, if you come this way, we promise there's true joy. And we're telling them to maybe go against the current. But I think that's our challenge. Our okay. ch challenge is to, to uh, uh, give people the uh, enthusiasm of knowing, hey, if I do God's will, I'm going to be really happy. I'm going to have a wonderful li life. And then I'm going to, I'm going to go to heaven. So it's exciting. So I think that's what we need to it's do. It's exciting. So it's not just, yeah. you know, rules and stuff. <laughs> um, you mentioned Pope Francis earlier, and I always like to ask you Synod Fathers, because we're on the outside, and it's so nice for us to see him in there with his brother bishops. What do you think his impact has been on, his, on this Synod, just by his presence, and maybe talking with him during these three weeks? Oh, it's wonderful. Uh, he's a, a, a really holy man, mm. and he's welcoming. And the other day, I think yesterday or the day before, the day before, in the afternoon, uh, he was uh, greeting each one of the bishops coming in, cardinals and bishops coming into the uh, synod hall. So it was wow. beautiful to see that how he really? goes out of his way to say hello to the 270 of us. One by one. One by one. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that was beautiful. <laughs> we have a lot of families that are watching our show from home, from Los Angeles and, and all over the world. And they may not understand everything that's going on. I know I don't understand every little thing, but what's a message that, that you would just personally like to give to families that may be tuning in, that may be having some difficulty or get, just getting discouraged? And Well, I think the, the most important thing is to know that God is with us. Mm. that God is present to each one of us in our personal life, in our families. And now the sin of the families is also helping us to understand and see that the church is really interested in supporting marriage and the family. That uh, really, really what we want to do is be there, be mm. out there to make, to help people. T Today I was talking about three things that we are, that we are trying to, uh, to uh, get across from the sin. One is important for of supporting families in their spirituality. Because it's so challenging nowadays to live our Catholic faith in our daily life. Yeah. Because there are so many distractions. So spirituality is one thing. Uh, the other thing is unity. Because we are so uh, uh, busy and moving. And so at the importance of family unity. And I think for that, the, uh, even the social media is helping us to be together. I think that's And you're on so Twitter. Yeah. What, what is your, is, oh, uh, we'll put it up later. I think it's Archbishop <laughs> Gomez. I think you can follow him on Twitter, but it's very inspirational what you're writing. And I think when you can use social media, um, even if it's just a little phrase, even if it's just something from the gospel, your personal reflection, social media. But uh, you're right. I think so many families are split apart and distant, even if it's just coming together for dinner. Exactly. Maybe yeah. this could make the difference. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I thank you so much for coming on our program. Um, there's the so much. Third thing. Oh wait, what's the third? <laughs> Don't forget. I thought it was that. social media. Sorry. No, that's the second one. <laughs> okay. the, 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 the third one is that, that we we need to feel the uh, call to be missionaries. Okay. Missionaries of the family, and and I think now is a time of mission to go out and share with the people mm. with the people out there the beauty of God's plan for for creation, for marriage, and for the family. So spirituality. Praying together, let's say. And the exactly. second one was unity, unity coming unity. together, even yeah. when we're distracted by our cell phones, <laughs> which I have right yeah. here. And then the missionary aspect uh, of going out. And that's one thing I've heard again and again from the Synod Hall. Missionary families helping new couples and el older people yeah. helping engaged couples. So that would be wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time for being on the program. Again, Archbishop Gomez, the Archbishop of Los Angeles, one of the Synod Fathers, and stay tuned for a lot more news about the Synod. We are a long way from over here in Rome. There's a lot still to be done. Uh, that's our show for this evening. Just remember, for all the latest information on the Synod, visit our special Synod page on EWTN.com and follow us on Twitter, at EWTN. Follow the Archbishop as well. Send us your questions and comments using the hashtag EWTN Synod. We're covering this from all angles on EWTN News Nightly, Joan Lewis's blog and radio show, and the world over. For now, I'm Mary Shovlin from Rome. Good night.